evening. And welcome to Fish Tales, a project of the Gloucester Writer Center in conjunction with the Gloucester Stage Company, which as you can see is still empty. We're five months into the pandemic and still doing all we can to bring you some wonderful programming. Tonight, we have a wonderful storytelling lineup, but first I wanna thank Henry Farini and Eileen Springer of the Gloucester Writer Center and Bob Walsh and Chris Griffiths of Cluster Stage, the artistic director and the managing director. And also I'd like to thank Maureen Aylward, who is the founder of Fish Tales and started this wonderful program. And Casey Breton, who's our storyteller in residence this year. And all the storytellers we've had, past and present, that have made Fish Tales the wonderful experience it's been. Part of the best of of fish tales, the best part is having you with us in person, but we can't do that just yet. So here's another one done remotely, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. This is Are We There Yet? And whether this is a actual road trip or a metaphor, I, I don't know. I haven't heard the stories yet. I'm looking forward to them. We'll start with Casey. Casey Breton is our storyteller in residence this year, and she's been doing a fabulous job, especially considering that this is the plague year and we have to do it all remotely. Casey is a former elementary school teacher, and believe it or not, that experience has been really useless in terms of having her shepherd of kids through the elementary school process of remote learning. Casey also works at Common Crow, and you can say hi to her if you uh, happen to recognize her behind the mask. She's a writer, too. Her middle grade novel comes out next month. Here's Casey. One. I had a whole story planned for this event. It was a silly story about an RV trip I took out west last summer with my husband and three kids. The five of us rolling free in Montana and Wyoming, hiking to waterfalls, swimming in crystal clear mountain lakes, eating wild huckleberries by the fistful. A bucket list sort of thing. There has been a sea change since I first thought of sharing that story. The pandemic hit, the movement for black lives took off, and suddenly my silly white person story just seemed silly. What kind of story is that for times like this? Two. I'd read about this place in Montana years ago. Massive works of art placed in the middle of nowhere. Bike paths snaking for miles on the back step of the Beartooth Highway. Just the name of it, Beartooth Highway. Oh man, heaven. I marked it on a map and traced my finger over it a hundred times. We saved money, we bought tickets and made reservations. We took time off of work, we packed up and headed out west. Me and my favorite people, a 23-foot camper and the open road. I dreamed about it for so long. And then the day came. I looked out the window and I saw the place. He was real. And we were really there. We pulled in. The beauty just took my breath away. I felt like a giddy child. And then there were my own children, the real ones I had been sharing 23 feet of living space with for three weeks. And they were not giddy. They were tired. They were hungry. They did not want to bike for miles and miles in the middle of nowhere. My youngest one expressed this quite passionately. He was screaming, he was crying, he was refusing to do what I commanded him to do. He was having a full-blown meltdown. He was ruining my dream. Things between us escalated, and I could hear myself saying, if I don't get out of this fucking camper right now, one of us is going to die. Three. It's a silly story and none of us died. I carry that story with me every day because in my own little white world, in my own privileged way, 
it's a small reminder of a big truth, that having a dream and making it come true are two totally separate things. Dreams are perfect and beautiful. Making them come true is messy and painful. My silly story is a reminder that the point on the map is not the place itself. I wanted to kill my own child right there in the parking lot of paradise. But when I think about it now, I realize that my tired, hungry, cranky kid wasn't ruining my dream. He was making it real. Thank you. Great story, Casey. That was wonderful. Sometimes when I'm telling a story to my friends and I'm in the middle of it and I start wondering, did that really happen or did I dream it? Sometimes on long tr road trips, the difference is hard to tell. <laughs> the line gets a little blurry. Next up, we have Abram Kilsmeyer Jones. And he's married with three kids, and he is uh, a runner. If you live in Magnolia, you've probably seen him running around, because that's what he does in all kinds of weather. And this is presumably where he gets ideas for his sermons, because he's the pastor of the Union Congregational Church in Magnolia. These pastor types love to tell stories. And here's Abrams from a road trip a long time ago. It had been a really good road trip so far. I was with my longtime college roommate, David Bradley, our really good mutual friend, John Fugate. We were headed north on I-90 from the Chicago suburbs to Minneapolis for turkey and football for Thanksgiving weekend. The three of us had found the perfect nexus of our musical tastes in listening to some late 90s U2 live concert bootlegs. Things were great, we were having good conversation, life was good, until we stopped at a McDonald's rest area in Wisconsin. David went to the bathroom and washed his hands, and then as we were getting back into the car, David had the biggest most smug, stupidest grin on his face. And he looked at us and he said, guys, smell my finger. And Fugate was quick to smell David's finger, even though he didn't really want to. He recoiled a little bit, but smelled David's finger and then started to launch us back onto the interstate. David was in the front seat passenger side and I was in the back. And then David turned to me and said, Abram, smell my finger. No. Abram, smell my finger. No, I don't want to smell your stupid finger. Abram, it smells good, just smell my finger. David, get your finger out of my face and put it somewhere else. This interaction was somewhat emblematic of my relationship to David. In fact, I had written a song about it. The lyrics are, roommate talks every Sunday afternoon, wade through the mire in the muck, is it a miracle of God or just dumb luck? It's a wonder that we ever get along. It's a wonder that we ever get along. David and I had heard from friends that our bickering was a frustration to them. We did it in private and we bickered publicly as well. And mature college students that we were, when David and I heard this from various friends, we actually just thought it was funny and decided that we should bicker more often in front of our friends. It became a, a point of pride and a, a thing that drew us closer together. That was not the dynamic, however, that was present in that Subaru, Forest Green Subaru SW2 on the interstate that day. We were not trying to bother Fugate. We were taking a stand for what we knew was right. And what I knew was right was that I should not have to smell David's finger. So Fugate was beside himself, and we were driving at this point, and Fugate reached out, literally, for the only thing in front of him, which was his car horn. And he laid on the horn continuously as David and I went back and forth. Smell my finger. No, smell my finger. I don't have to. Smell my finger. Go away. And I was a little bit self-conscious. Fugate was trying to diffuse the situation and get David or me to break and I was a little bit self-conscious that here was Fugate, this already fast driver, going probably 85 miles an hour down the interstate with the horn 
going loudly and maybe people thought it was a hostage situation or were they going to call 911 or I, sh I should surely smell David's finger now but I just wouldn't do it. After five minutes, Fugate's car horn stopped. It made a whimpering sound and then it breathed its last and it died, never to function again for the life of that vehicle. I had won. David finally, some 20 minutes later, turned back around, we listened to whatever music it was, and I did not have to smell his finger. But as Fugate later would say, there were no winners. We were all losers that day. We eventually got to our destination and we had a great time together and with friends and family. It was a good road trip after all, although Fugate did say that he would never again road trip with me and David in the same car together, even if the fate of all humanity depended on it. But we eventually got to our destination. And it may be a small comfort, but in these pandemic days that stretch on and on, I remind myself that even the most maddening road trip can end in a delicious Thanksgiving dinner. And David, if you're watching, history is told by the victors, and I'm still not going to smell your finger. Thanks, Abram. The best stories, I think, involve long road trips and long friendships. Next up, we have Doug Rich, who is from the Midwest, and, but he's lived a lot of places before settling down here. He's been a musician, or he is a musician, a businessman, and a terrible golfer. He's the father of two, the grandfather of three, and he's married to Susie, whom he calls the woman of a thousand ideas. Maybe we ought to get Susie for fishtails, but tonight it's Doug's turn. Hi, I'm Doug Rich, and I'd like to share a fishtail with you. Happy to be here with you today. And I'm gonna to give you a preface before I give you the actual story, which is very short, but it's a very important story to me and profoundly changed my life. So, are we there yet? This is a story about my father, my grandfather, and myself. And uh, they would say, I believe, no. And I think they would be amazed that we are where we seem to be right now in 2020, based on the way they lived their lives and the things they did. Um, and they would have guessed that we were much further along the way, probably not slipping back to where we seem to be now. So, when I was raised, and this goes back a couple of generations, not just my generation, but in my family, I noticed that um, it, there's a lot of stress on achievement and not a lot of stress on the negative factors that kind of lead us to where we are in life. So they believe that the best way to move forward was just to be your best self at all times in all situations. And that's what they did, and that's what they taught us to do. Uh, if they talked about um, you know, race, it was just in terms of, of positive in terms of what had been achieved. Look at what so-and-so did. Um, there was a lot of talk back in the, in the 60s, you know, about the first black this and the first black that. Um, but they made a big deal out of those kind of things. They were things to celebrate, and really they were just teaching us, you know, just to achieve, just do what you do, and you'll get where you want to go. That's what they believed. Um, and I do believe that as well. And there are some stipulations that, of course, we have to deal with in our, our current climate, but nonetheless, um, that's how we live our lives. So one thing that they did for us, um, myself, my siblings, my cousins, is that they taught us their, their life skills, the things they valued the most in life, and how to do them well. My grandfather was a semi-professional golfer. The first thing he tried to pass on to me was his love of golf. When I was little, he took me out to caddy for him, and I was a horrendous caddy because I just chased butterflies and ran from dragonflies, and that was about the only interest I had out there on the golf course. So quickly he dropped that and moved on to other things. They also love fishing. I come from a family of fishermen uh, and oystermen, actually, historically as well. And being from Philadelphia, we used to go fishing down on the Maryland shore or go crabbing, my two favorite things in life back then. Uh, when I was a young man, very young man, I think I was a pretty good fisherman, becoming a pretty good fisherman. We did deep water fishing uh, all the time down, down there um, in the Maryland, Virginia area. Now, this story I'm about to tell you is the story of uh, this is not a story of success and achievement. I'm actually a failed fisherman, but it's a funny little story. Um, and I will tell it to you right now. Now, I believe that this took place in Lake Erie. In my mind, that's where I believe I was. I can picture the boat. I can picture my father, my grandfather, myself on this boat. 
but um, I, there's no evidence that this type of fish I'm about to describe to you actually lives up there. So maybe I wasn't in Lake Erie, but this is absolutely a true story. So in trying to pass on this important skill of fishing to me, uh, we were out fishing one day, just the three of us. And um, I, by that point, I think was a pretty good fisherman. I thought I was anyway. I had no qualms about being out there, about landing fish, dressing fish, you name it. I thought I was there. But this particular day, as I was fishing, and I had something on the line, and was reeling it in, felt like it was a pretty big fish. So, but I did bring him in, landed him on the boat. Turns out, no, it wasn't really a big fish, but it was a funny looking fish I'd never really seen before. But um, I didn't really think anything about it, it's just another fish. So as I walk over to this fish, start to pick it up so I can take the hook out of the mouth and hopefully throw it in the cooler, you know, it's a win for me. Um, this fish started to puff up as a, a spiny little fish, kind of a greenish color, not attractive, but then it puffed up and I flipped out. Um, my father and grandfather heard him laughing behind me hysterically. They thought it was hilarious. Little did they know what they'd done to me that day. So I've never been the same when it comes to fishing after that. Um, I now wear a glove on my left hand if I go fishing to take the fish hook out because when I go to reach for a fish and just pick it up, you know, that little sensation you get when, when the scales start to cut in a little bit, um, it's a good feeling, but now it reminds me of that fish puffing up in my hand. Can't do it. So that's my story about my life experience to share with my family. Uh, how in this case it didn't work out, I'm a failed fisherman. That is my fish tale. Thank you, Doug, that was a wonderful story. I'm here in the, uh, what is it, the sixth row? The fifth row of the side section, and I've gotta say these side seats are pretty good. Uh, next up we have Dick Prouty. Uh, Dick was the Chief Executive Officer and Executive Director of Project Adventure, Inc. from 1982 to his retirement in 2015. This organization had, has had a huge impact on the development of experiential learning and it has trained and certified over 350,000 professional educators, trainers, and therapists. Dick and his wife Doris have two children and four grandchildren and a lot of collective adventures under their belt. Dick takes us on uh, a journey today through the late 60s and early 70s that might prompt us all to ask, are we there yet? Well, it's the summer of 1967 and I've been invited up to the second floor apartment in Queensbridge where Doris's family was to meet them and have the proverbial Sunday afternoon dinner. So we're sitting down to a great spread and all of a sudden, bang, bang, two loud gunshots outside. Everybody just continues to eat. Doesn't even notice that there was anything. And I, um, I look up and I say, weren't those gunshots? And I said, yeah. I said, shouldn't we call the police? And they looked at me like I was crazy. And so I just continued to eat. And afterwards, Dora said to me, Dick, we never do that. We never call the police. If anybody's crazy enough to do that, and the police actually come when a black person calls, you might get shot. So, lesson learned. A year later, I'm walking into my apartment with a good friend uh, in the Lower East Side, Dave, and we get accosted by three black teenagers at knife point, and they just want our cash and our wallets, which we give them. And then they will amble off. And we, so we run upstairs, and we call the police, because sometimes I'm a slow learner. So the police get there within a minute, and we get in the squad car, and about a block away on Houston, we see the kids 50 yards away, they, they get out, they get, pull their pistols, they start running after the kids. Two kids get away, but they get one kid, bring him back, put him on the uh, hood of the squad car, and start beating him, cursing two officers. One pistol whips him, and Dave and I are in the back seat, and we're like stunned, I'm in shock. I don't know what to do. Um, and they get in, put the kid in the front seat, and we start driving down to the uh, police station. So we get there, they take the kid upstairs, and sit Dave and I down, and they, they, they okay, the guy's gonna press charges, and on the drive in, I had been thinking about this, I decided I wasn't gonna press charges. Well, they were really upset, and they started yelling at us, we just got up, left, and walked home. 
So um, Doris and I got married and moved to Manchester, Mass, a little bit different than the Lower East Side. And um, I was teaching in Manchester High School and we had our first child, Isla Sahai, that many of you know. And she was walking downtown with Isla in a, in a uh, basket. Uh, and all of a sudden there were there's two uh, Manchester ladies with big broad hats walk up and say, oh, whose baby is that? Because Doris with a big fro and, and darker skin obviously must be a nanny. And Doris looked at them and in her best Manchester accent said, oh darlings, that would be my baby. <laughs> and this is a apocryphal story now in our family because it symbolizes many things. Um, but it's the thread, the, thing, the uh, thread line is there, even though the police aren't involved. So about two years later, um, Isla's nearly three and Doris is pregnant with Seth and I'm teaching in Manchester, I'm feeling good, I'm teaching well, I'm uh, building a boat with my good friend Jim Scholl. And one mid-October evening, it's the Nixon McGovern campaign and Wallace is on the ticket and all of a sudden I hear fire alarms. And I get up and look out and there's a fire on the front lawn and a crowd of people coming up and the, the fire trucks are there, so we rush out. And all of a sudden I see it, it's a cross burning on the lawn that they're putting out with a fire extinguisher, they didn't really need the fire trucks. And wrapped around the bottom of the cross is a Wallace sticker. Well, I just froze. I. I was incredulous, and Doris, of course, being herself, walked up to the people and started talking, said, isn't this crazy? What a crazy thing this is. And started making friends with people she didn't know. She knew a few of the people. And that lasted about 20 minutes, and everybody went home, and we went in and went to bed. And of course, Doris didn't even cross her mind to call the police, and I didn't call the police either, because now I crossed over to understanding that my privilege didn't matter, I wasn't gonna call the police because we might get in trouble with the police. And then the, the call started again. We had calls before that I hadn't connected to, the, to this. The call saying, N-word go home, N-word go away. And um, but, so then some friends of ours in the neighborhood let us know who they thought had done it. And it was a grandmother who was making the calls and her lobsterman son who had a lobster boat in Lane's Cove. So we put the word out that we knew who it was and what they had done, the deed, and it stopped. So we were relieved and we went on with our life. And um, you know, the theme here, are we, are we there yet? Are we there with racial justice? And I couldn't help thinking this whole year of George Floyd and all the protests and so forth, of my five years, 67 to 72, and my personal awakening and now the country's awakening and the parallel, and it's now a majority of people, black and white, know that the police are big trouble for black people and we need serious juvenile justice reform and police reform at a minimum. And I think that we can get there now, but we're definitely not there yet. So I hope that you will uh, join me and others in working for racial justice. Thank you. This was 50 years ago, and we're still not there yet. Thank you, Dick. Those were powerful vignettes. Next up, we have Layla Goodman. She's a vit Fishtails veteran, and we're delighted to have her back. Layla is such a Gloucester presence that I was surprised to learn that she actually grew up in Florida. She teaches high school biology at the Gann Academy and is a part-time doula. She and her husband, Barry, live in Magnolia with their dog, Scout, and five hens. If you do the math, that's a lot of eggs for two people. Layla is a born storyteller, so I'm really looking forward to her story tonight. My parents got divorced when I was 13. My dad got remarried 11 days later. But that actually didn't stop him from having, continuing to have multiple affairs, including with a woman named Pearl. My dad decided to introduce Pearl and I. He thought we'd like each other. Pearl had a horse, I had a horse. And I did like Pearl. She was a quirky horsewoman who worked at the racetrack. I think she genuinely liked me as well, though I know she befriended me because she wanted to be closer to my father. The summer I was 15, Pearl told me she was going to Lexington, Kentucky 
to work with Tony, a former client of my father's, at his dog training facility and asked if I wanted to go. My dad thought it was a good idea. I think he felt bad that he couldn't give more of himself to Pearl, so why not give his daughter? I arrived in Lexington to find a 300-year-old, slightly dilapidated farmhouse, huge pastures with two horses, and a, a downstairs kennel with 21 Dobermans and one German Shepherd. When I first looked at all those Dobermans, I thought, how can anyone ever tell them apart? At dinner that night, which was mostly plates on our laps on a couch, I learned there were 10 of us living at the house that summer, although I never really knew why most of them were there or what they were doing. The bedroom I shared with Pearl was a small bedroom off the main bedroom where Tony and his wife Anita slept. I went to sleep and I awoke at six the next morning as is my lifelong habit and I really needed to pee, like pee coming up to my eyeballs needing to pee. But there were married people next door. I mean, I don't know, do married people have sex all the time? <laughs> I gingerly opened the door and there lay Tony and Anita, feet apart, Tony bare ass naked to the sky. The mornings were spent putting the dogs through their training regimen. I learned that you have to use your diaphragm, say what you mean and mean what you say. I got to know the personalities of each of the dogs, Queenie and Thumper, Red and, and Inga. In the afternoons, we would do attack dog training. We'd bring two or three dogs at a time. Tony would dress up in a special suit with a big foam arm and Pearl or Anita and later myself would say, sick em! And the dogs would run across this field and grab onto that arm. Then we'd say, off! and the dogs would release. That was a key selling point. Attack on command, release on command. One time a dog missed the foam and bit right through Tony's arm. He didn't get mad as he wiped the blood away. He said it was his fault. He didn't put the sleeve on correctly. Tony was amazing with the dogs. Really, he was amazing with all animals. One afternoon in the horse field, he whistled to one of the horses and she came right over. He climbed on, no halter, no bridle, nothing. He gave her a kick and she took off running. She ran around and around, maybe 20 minutes. And then she came right back to where they started, came to a soft stop, and Tony just climbed off. Feeding 10 people, 22 dogs and two horses is expensive, especially when there's not much business, if any business, for the dog training skills. I soon learned a strategy. One day we went grocery shopping, Tony, Anita, Pearl, and myself. When we got to the store, the three women went over to the produce section and we bought some potatoes and onions, some lettuce, some other veggies. Tony met us back at the register. We paid for our produce and when we got to the car, Tony opened his jean jacket and pulled out steak after steak after steak and then he reached down into his pants and he pulled some more. That's when I learned, oh, my norms aren't everyone's norms. <laughs> at night, we would sip rum and Cokes and sometimes Pearl would get a little bit tipsy and she would go into great detail about her sex life with my father. This was a subject I found both repulsive and titillating as a 15 year old. There's one more thing I should probably tell you. I mentioned that Tony was a former client of my father's. My father was a criminal attorney and the crime that he had represented Tony for was molesting several boys in his Boy Scout troop. I must have registered some concern because I distinctly remember my father saying, don't worry, he only molests boys. But that summer was not traumatic for me. Learning to use my diaphragm and say what I mean and mean what I say turned out to be an enormously helpful life skill, especially with husbands, students, and raising children. I've had a life with a series of well-trained dogs and I even met my husband at an animal hospital where I worked. I saw that people use their talents and skills to be productive and to do good, and they use those exact same talents and skills to do harm, and sometimes great harm. That summer, I learned it about Tony, my father, and even Pearl. 
It took me many more years before I learned it about myself. Are we there yet? Absolutely not. But I am sure that embracing that complexity and not just placing people, especially those we most vehemently disagree with, into the bad box or the good box is essential to getting there. Thank you. Thank you, Layla. Finding your power is the journey to beat all journeys. Bobby Wayne is actually a published storyteller, which makes her a pro, but she has lots of other expressive outlets as well. She's a harpist, a singer-songwriter, a music therapist, a painter, a puppeteer, a dog trainer, and she'll even paint a sign for you. She also claims to have once been the most incompetent waitress in New York. I don't know if that's true, but her story is. In the summer of 69, I was a camp counselor at Camp Swatara in the Blue Mountains of Pennsylvania. Sam and I were co-counselors taking six kids on a overnight camping trip. There was Sally, 13-year-old blonde, who showed up wearing pink shorts for the trip. Susie, who was a dark-haired little whiner, who kept reminding us that she had a heart murmur and needed special care. Carl, who was blonde and big and Pennsylvania Dutch. Tom, tall, skinny fellow who immediately began examining the rocks turning him over and finally choosing a rather large one and putting it in his backpack. Ronnie, who was diabetic, but he was going to be fine as long as he took his medicine on time. And Ruth, a little black girl from Philly, who had a chip on her shoulder bigger than her backpack. The day was hot and humid and really buggy, and we had to stop within half an hour of starting because Carl's face was bright red and Susie was wailing that she was having a heart attack. Ruth said, why don't you shut up and have your heart attack and then we could leave you? And meanwhile, the other kids were laughing and I turned around and they were laughing at Tom who was choosing yet another large rock to add to his collection. Sam said, guys, we're a team when we're in the woods. We depend upon each other for our lives. We started up again, but by lunch we had already had to stop twice. And that's when Susie came up to me and whispered, Sally came up and whispered, Bobby, I have my period for the first time and I don't know what to do, I'm bleeding. I wasn't prepared for this. All I had with me were extra strength tampons. And so I looked at her pink shorts and I explained, how to use a tampon, and she went over behind the bushes and got the job done. And then we caught up to the group. And that's when Carl, for the third time, snuck up behind me and went, Rah! and I grabbed him and I said, Carl, honey, don't do that anymore. <laughs> By the time we got to the campsite, it was pitch black. Tom and Sam built a fire, and I got up and asked for volunteers to help make the food. No one made a sound except for Carl's theatrical snoring. I looked around in the firelight at the faces. One was missing. Ronnie's gone, I said, and Sam jumped up and said, I'll find him, you guys make dinner. And off he went. I looked at the campers and I said, I am not hungry, and I am not your mother, and if you want dinner, you can make it yourselves. And I went over and sat down. Ruth stood up and said, you guys get over here and help me. Come on, Carl, you read the directions. And to my amazement, they started making dinner. Sam came back, he was white-faced. I'm gonna have to run back to the road, hitchhike back to the camp and tell Jerry, the camp director. I watched the wood swallow him up. Somehow the kids got their dinner and they all got to bed. And I sat poking at the fire with a big stick, worrying. Ronnie was out there. He didn't take his medicine. There were rattlers and copperheads in the woods. And then I heard a rustling and I jumped up and grabbed the stick. And a small figure stepped into the firelight. 
Ronnie, I grabbed him and I hugged him so hard he squeaked. You get your meds right now. Go get your dinner, there's stew in the pot, and go right to bed. Sometime later in the night, Sam and Jerry return, and I watched the relief flood their faces while they um, learned that he was back. Jerry, you better stay with us so you don't have to walk back through the woods, we said. No, 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 I could use the walk, he said, and beside, I don't think any of us are ever really alone. In the morning, we woke to the sound of breakfast being prepared. Ruth had organized everybody and given them jobs, including Ronnie. We ate our oatmeal with relish while we listened to Ronnie tell how I had just stepped off the trail to take a pee and I got lost. Susie said, we thought you were dead. We thought you fell and had a coma and then a bear came along and rah! and everybody laughed. On the way back, Ronnie walked up front with Sam and Ruth had a little shadow because Susie was following her around like a puppy. I could hear them laughing together in the line. Sally was being pestered to death by Carl who kept telling her stupid jokes and I stepped off of a rock and got my sock wet crossing a stream which caused a huge blister to rise. So I fell back a little and I was adjusting my sock and then I heard a voice say, Bobby, you gotta keep up with the group. I looked up, it was Tom. He said, you know, if you need to lean on somebody, you could lean on me. I'm pretty strong, you know, from carrying all those rocks. Almost everyone in town knows Wendy Fitting. The Rev Wendy was the minister at the Gloucester UU Church for 24 years and is deeply involved in the Gloucester community, including having been a founding member of the Gloucester Writers' Center. But did you know that Wendy was once a private detective? That's so cool. Wendy obviously embraces life's challenges, which is why she's got a lot of stories to tell. Here's one of them. This question, are we there yet? Uh, it's the kind of question, it's a gnarly question. It's the kind of question that engages philosophers in duels for years. What does it mean? I decided instead to consult the newly discovered lost parable of Jesus. And I'll just give you the gist for some insight into this question. So Jesus says to the crowd, the kingdom of God is at hand. And a lawyer in the crowd says, are we there yet? And Jesus, who, by the way, had a great sense of humor, said, any road will get you there if you don't know where you're going. So that's kind of our task, my task, in this story. Um, is about emptying the box of rocks that I've been carrying around for years, the boxes of my um, privileged assumptions in the world. And right now, of course, the tectonic plates are shifting and the fires are coming up out of the heart of the earth. And so this, for me, as a white person of privilege, is a, is a good time to take stock in order to be ready um, to join the road to there. So a couple stories about this process of dumping these rocks, um, which came to me by surprise wasn't something I decided to do. And it was at the laundromat um, down, used to be down near Walgreens, downtown. And it was a small laundromat and it was chock-a-block with small aisles and stacks of washers and dryers facing each other in these narrow spaces. So I was down there, it was a sunny morning in summer, few people there. But in the aisle that I was gonna use, there was a young woman on her cell phone screaming at somebody, furious at somebody, and using all kinds of horrible language and F-bombs. And, and right next to her, an elderly woman, elderly than me, elderer than me, was get, putting her wash, getting, trying to get her wash out of the washing machine, and it was all tangled up. And I thought, this, 
woman, this elderly person, is right next to this, this girl that everybody can hear her, you know, screaming in rage. And I thought, wow, that is so rude. Um, but the elderly woman didn't, you know, was ignoring her, didn't seem to hear her. <clears throat> but uh, I, I was all geared up to offer a Jeremiah about how, how rude and, and awful the fact this screaming and these expletives were, you know, to this older woman who may not even have known. You know, she was very sort of um, gracious. Uh, she wasn't registering anything, but, you know, I was about to come down on this girl with moral outrage for what, for what she was doing to, to the space with her language and stuff. And right before I was ready to get up on the pulpit, she hung up the phone and she turned to the woman who was trying to untangle her wash and said, can I help you with that? <laughs> and um, I thought, oh, whoops, okay. <laughs> What's happening here? I'm gonna remember this because it completely uh, disrupted my, my righteous plan. Um, and it was this young woman, this trash mouth woman, <laughs> helping the elderly woman, being very nice and polite and helpful. And so that was an initial kind of um, epiphany about getting rid of the weight of my assumptions, because I had assumed all kinds of terrible stuff about this young woman. And then, and, and that stuck with me, and I thought, okay, this is a lesson. The next, the next story was a number of years ago, um, uh, after the take back and the night march in Gloucester, there was a gathering at the Universalist Church uh, just to sort of check in with each other. And there were a few people there, women, maybe about seven of us. And as we went around the table to introduce ourselves, four of the women, um, in turn, gave a long list of their credentials. They were all human service professionals and they introduced themselves with their bona fides, you know, their degrees, their positions, what papers they'd written. And they were talking too long. It was like, you're okay, it's okay. They got to me and I said, well, I'm the pastor of this church. And then there were two women next to me and I didn't know them, I hadn't met them. The first woman said, well, I'm nobody. And the second woman, her friend, I guess, said, I'm, I'm nobody. And there may have been an edge to their response that said, you know, get real. And there was, there was a, a sense of disquiet in the room, but nobody said anything. But I, I took that home with me, because I knew from the laundromat that, you know, these experiences were gonna happen probably, if I was open to them. And, and so for this journey, you know, while the plates are crashing and the fires are burning on the earth, I'm gonna get ready, um, getting rid of more of the encumbering um, assumptions that I've carried around with me in order to be who I am when I'm at home. Thank you, Wendy, that was a wonderful story. Next up, we have Keith Harris, who's a passionate cyclist, but you probably won't see him around here. He and his wife live in Rowley, where they own Choice Graphics. Uh, but this guy is a serious cyclist, possibly on the nut job level. He's biked across the country and raised nearly $50,000 for Rotary. If anyone has ever thought, are we there yet? It's probably Keith. This story is from when he cycled across country. Do you believe in magic? I hope so. I spent a summer living on my bike. Along the way, I learned that every moment is a gift, full of discovery. But you have to be careful, because a moment can be missed when you're in a hurry. I'd like to share one of them with you. I was on the Crow Creek Indian Reservation in South Dakota. My life was on my bike, so it was heavy. My progress was slow, but steady. 
The day was getting on towards evening. I came to a crossroads. A car stopped to let me by. The driver rolled his window down and asked me, where are you going? Headed to Fort Townsend, I said, hoping to stay at the campground there. Well, where do you leave from, he said. I left from Seattle. He said, no way. He said, where are you going? I said, eventually I'm going to end up in Boston. He said, wow, you're crazy, he nodded his head. He said, well, good luck, and he pulled out. Just a few minutes later, same blue car, pulled up next to me, slowed down, rolled the window down. Next to him was a young girl, very quiet. Said, how many miles do you ride a day? I said, usually 90 to 100. Said, really? I said, with all that gear? I said, with all this gear. Wow, you must, uh, you must get really hungry. I said, where are you eating supper tonight? I said, I've seen signs along the way for uh, the restaurant at the casino. I'm hoping I can get good food for a cyclist there. What do you think? He said, yeah, you will. He said, in fact, my wife works there. I'll drive ahead and I'll tell her you're coming. I thanked him and we parted ways. He and his car, me and my bike. A few minutes later, same car pulled up next to me again. This time, his daughter had a sheepish grin, still quiet, but I could tell she was getting a kick out of her father's preoccupation. He said, you know, why don't you just stay with us tonight? <laughs> now, I have to be honest here. They had warned me against riding through the reservation. I was supposed to stay away. It was too dangerous, they told me. Too much crime. It just wasn't safe. But I was riding with a purpose. I set out to see this country, not just the glittery tourist centers, but I wanted to see the real country, and I wanted to meet real people. Here was an opportunity. A night with a Native American family? Are you kidding? I couldn't let this pass me by. So I said, sure, I'd love to. Got to the casino, and I met Maddie. Poor Maddie. Can you just imagine what she must have thought when Chaitan came in and said, I met this stranger on a bike, and oh, by the way, I invited him to stay with us tonight. But thankfully, Maddie was both gracious and friendly. Had a wonderful dinner, and then I rode over to the motel where they were staying. The room was tiny and very crowded. Somehow we, fit, uh, we managed to get everything in there, Ch Chaitan and I got to talking. He was full of questions about my ride. And I was full of questions about his culture. It was very interesting. And as time progressed, I became aware of the presence of stereotypes in my mind and their role in his life. There were two things Chaitan emphasized to me, two things to him I needed to understand. The first was, he and Maddie did not drink alcohol. And the second was they were both gainfully employed. I couldn't help but wonder why that mattered so much to him. The conversation turned to family. His daughter Jasmine had just turned 11 the week before. In fact, she had performed her ceremonial sun dance at the tribal powwow. Jasmine had been very quiet, she was shy, hadn't said a thing all night, but at this, she became very animated. She said, I actually have my gown in the closet, would you like to see it? I said, are you kidding? I'd love to. This to me was a perfect moment. She went to the closet and she came out with this, it's hard to describe, it was just this incredibly beautiful, ornate, outfit, the long white dress with pink striping and, and homemade. There was a, a leather belt that was all colorful. Um, she had leggings that were 
covered with thousands of tiny beads sewn into them. And pink ribbons with feathers that she had braided into her waist-long hair. Every piece was handmade by family members, by friends, even by tribal elders. And the beauty of it was that every piece had a story. There was a connection. This was culture. And it was a magical moment for all of us. Jasmine loved being the center of attention. For a while, she mattered. For me, I just loved this glimpse into their world. Breakfast the next morning was pretty special. Gone was the quiet, shy Jasmine. In her place, a young girl full of energy, bursting with questions. For instance, what was Boston like, she wanted to know. Did I get lonely when I was out there riding? And uh, did I really need to leave that day? Barriers had come down that night, and we all felt it. Sadly, time came when I had to get back on the road. Chaitan gave me a card in which they had each written a message. And he had placed a sprig of sage, which for the Lakota is very special. They burn it during the religious ceremonies. And when given as a gift, it is a symbol of peace and friendship. I was incredibly humbled and touched. And it struck me that just the day before, we had been strangers. And now there were tears in my eyes as I struggled to say goodbye. And I still feel it now. It was then that Chetan told me that in their language, they do not have a word for goodbye. Instead, they say doxa, which simply means until we meet again. I like that. So I rode east out of town, very contemplative and very thankful. It was a chance encounter, a moment that I did not let pass me by. We could have missed it, but we did not let that happen, Chaitan and I. A few minutes later, that familiar blue car passed me by one last time. I thought, what did I forget? Pulled over in front of me and stopped. The passenger door opened up and Jazz stepped out, took out her phone and took my picture. The white man who was riding his bike cross country. So now when I wonder, am I there yet? I remember that moment. Because it taught me that sometimes the place we're in such a hurry to get to isn't at all where we're supposed to be. I'd like to thank you for letting me share my moment. And I hope you found some magic in it. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Perhaps if we listen more, and emulated the first peoples of this country, we would be there by now. Thank you, that's our show for tonight. Thanks to our storytellers, to Gloucester Writers Center, to Gloucester Stage Company, and we hope we see you at the next Fish Tales. Good night. <laughs>